It's an honor to be back here in the Heinrich Böll Institute and to see Ralph and so many familiar faces again. Two years ago, if you remember, uh, we gave the whole of Jewish history in one hour in this room. And I'm pleased that some people have returned and some new faces. Uh, I'm always, Ralph knows that I'm always wary of introductions because um, what happens is that, and there were very, very nice words, and what happens is people say, well, you know, the talk was good, but it wasn't as good as the introduction said it was going to be. Uh, but um, we're going to try and do something very ambitious tonight. I haven't given this talk for a little while, and because we are constantly immersed in textual tradition and in uh, understanding the fundamental spiritual assets of the Jewish people. Therefore, this talk will be uh, different from any other time that I've ever tried this. Uh, and what often happens is that uh, there are, th look, there are 39 books of the Hebrew Bible. And some of you may remember that in London, I don't know if they still do it. There used to be a theatre company they're called the Reduced Shakespeare Company. Anybody familiar with that? And they did all 37 Shakespearean plays uh, in the course of about an hour and a half, including an intermission. And if I recall, they did 36 of the plays in the first half, and in the second half they just did Hamlet. But they did Hamlet forwards, backwards, sideways, and everything. So we could try that. I, I have an idea as to who would be the Hamlet of the Bible and maybe I'll point it out when we get to it. But what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to try and show every book of the Bible where it sits in a historical context and what its m primary message is and what it's trying to uh, achieve as a, as a textual and spiritual document. And then we can stand back and we can look at the whole thing together. I'm also going to do something tonight a little bit controversial. And that is... Uh, don't panic, I'm not about to leave the room. I, that, it, not, nothing as controversial as that. I'm just looking for somewhere to put my jacket because I realize that it's going to be too restrictive for my calisthenic um, uh, exercises. And that is, uh, I'm going to try and highlight um, aspects of the Bible that I think share some relevance and some light on the situation in the world today. That is where people in the audience will be leaving, not me. Uh, some of them may, you may share that understanding with me, but I'm just highlighting that. Now, two more prefatory remarks I want to say about this talk so that we understand, because as it is with Jewish history in one hour, some of you may have noticed that there's paper behind me. And it works like this. You remember the whole of Jewish history in one hour? Who was here for that talk, by the way? Okay, a few. Well, the, the, the way that talk worked was that the entire room was covered with paper. And each wall represented a thousand years, which is approximately a millennium. That's a joke. And what happened was we started, say, here. Well, I can't remember where in the room we started, but each wall was a thousand years, was a square. And we called this here minus 2000 or 2000 BCE and then we went up to minus 1000 and then to zero and then to 1000 CE and then we ended up more or less where we are now in history around about the year 2000. Everybody follow that schematic? Well tonight we're just focusing on the Bible and so the Bible really if we were to look at the whole of Jewish history in terms of this room being 4,000 years, th and imagine that, that this wall is about the same length as that one. It's not, but we can imagine that. Then the Bible was down to about halfway down this wall. So the Bible more or less goes up to round about minus 500 or 500 BCE. Everybody follow that? So that's our main uh, historical framework that we're working with, and that enables us to do this uh, to do a timeline so we can anchor and we can actually see I'm going to use a word that doesn't exist but the word is scalistically <laughs> try that one Gabriella <laughs> but by the way by the way I have to say this because I didn't say it last night it's not the first time I've worked with Stephen and Gabriella translate this and they are awesome they're fantastic anyone who's listening to them I, I'm not the easiest person to translate what I'm about to do what I'm about to do don't try at home 
especially if you don't have paper on the walls. It's not a simple exercise. I'm going to draw the first millennium of Jewish history. It's not simple. Here we go. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> That's a big thousand years. All right. I'm going to call this minus 1500 minus 1600 minus 1700 minus 1800 minus 1900 the other prefatory remark I wanted to make you're surely not going to stand there with all the colors no 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 I'll take them it's okay it's okay it's okay it's okay thank you but we're good we're good you have a question already <laughs> not not as not as many questions as I have already but go on from zero. A zero, well, okay, good question. Good question. Uh, the Jewish people have their own calendar, their own Hebraic calendar. The year in the Jewish calendar at the moment, can you see it? Oh, thank you. Brilliant. The year at the moment in the Jewish calendar is 5774. That's a figure that was calculated in the early Middle Ages is to, or even in the end of the classical period, to try and denote a type of schematic arising out of the calculations in the Bible about how old the world was since creation. I'm going to touch on that in a moment, but what I use for these talks is the secular counting that the world uses, uh, which has its own mystical understanding even within the Jewish tradition. So you might say, ah, oh, but that's all based on another religion's idea of what's going on, and it's true, but uh, certainly for our purposes it works out conveniently and most people can get their head around it. If I started using the words 5774 and say for the year zero is actually the year 3760, you'd get very confused so I use this schematic. you okay with that? But now that you've raised that, and I'm going to deal with that in a moment, I want to make one more prefatory remark. And that is, on the subject of translation, uh, Although I spend a lot of my time dealing with translation, because when I'm not giving talks, I'm actually a translator of classical uh, Hebrew and Aramaic texts in the Jewish tradition, and nevertheless, I'm, I'm a little bit anti-translation, and it's an important point to make in relation to the Bible. Although we can study the Bible and we can understand its message and its themes and read what it wants to tell us, the real encounter, the real encounter with the Hebrew Bible is through the language of Hebrew. If we are engaging with this revelation, which is the foundational document of the whole of Judeo-Christian culture, then you'll realize that the word of God is transmitted in the sacred language of Hebrew. And people go, oh, Hebrew, how am I going to learn Hebrew? I mean, well, but in fact, uh, Hebrew is not a difficult language, it's just different. And there's a whole bunch of two-year-olds running around Israel speaking Hebrew, so how difficult can it be? Uh, but nevertheless, you know, D David Ben-Gurion, the famous uh, former Israeli Prime Minister, once said, for example, that um, reading the book of Isaiah in any other language other than Hebrew is like kissing a beautiful woman through a handkerchief. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that. That might actually be interesting for some people. All right. So I want to talk about, I just, I just wanted to mention that really we're going to, that, that, that an engagement with this text is really an engagement with such a foundational level that um, if we can aspire to, to engage with the Bible in its original language, that is something that I think that uh, is an aspiration for those interested in the Bible, whether you are Jewish or not, that every word, every concept that you learn in Hebrew opens up new windows of understanding because uh, in translation it's never quite the same. All right. And now we're going to just address quickly what you said because um, we're going to start with the first book of the Bible and the first book of the Bible is, of course, the book of Genesis. And uh, Genesis contains um, material, uh, ideas, narratives, that clearly precede our modern understanding of the concept of time and clearly precedes uh, 
our understanding of 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 what is real and i and i and i know that some of you are sitting there going well what's his opinion and how does it work on on the relationship of how we understand the world scientifically and the book of genesis and much ink and even blood has been spilt on those questions there's if we are going to be very honest about it the bible and nothing i'm going to say is inconsistent with a a Jewish spiritual understanding of the Bible, but nothing is uh, that in the Bible, uh, we have to be very honest. The Bible, for much of it, is not what we could necessarily call a capital H historical document. Uh, it emerges, even within Jewish thinking, uh, certainly over the course of the last thousand years, that uh, some of the early parts of the Bible uh, are permitted to be read uh, as allegory. It doesn't mean that they did not happen. We haven't really found anything completely inconsistent with it. And in fact, on deeper, deeper levels, we find a tremendous resonance with our scientific understanding of the world. But until we get everything prior to where I've drawn on the line, everything prior to this belongs in a realm that is in almost timeless in a sense. Uh, the stories of Adam and Eve in the garden, the story of Noah, the story of the dispersals of humanity, these are aspects of the book of Genesis that... Uh, look, it's like this. I'm going to show, by the way, I'm going to show hopefully tonight where the Bible itself merges into objective historical reality. But I once, many years ago, I read a commentary on uh, the book of Genesis by someone you may have heard of. He's actually German, a person called uh, uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who went on to take on the uh, job description, ultimately, of Pope. And he wrote a book, he wrote a book, a commentary on the book of Genesis, a very, very deep, powerful commentary. I'm not going to go all into that, but what struck me... What struck me was that for, for, for him, uh, the, the whole of the book of Genesis, and, and, and when I say for him, I'm assuming that he is more or less representing the, the traditional perspective of the Roman Catholic Church, is that the whole of the book of Genesis is really, really, at the end of the day, about one specific moment. And that moment is the moment in the garden where Adam and Eve sin. That's the fall. And everything else is really about correcting that situation. In fact, certainly everything up to the year zero. And uh, from the year zero, then we have another phase of correction. And the Jewish people uh, do not look at the book of Genesis like that. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. It is the beginning of the world. And it is the beginning of a relationship with humanity and a relationship even more specifically with a certain part of humanity that is charged with the revelation of the divine in the world. That comes about through, and therefore the beginnings of a family and the beginnings of the Jewish people. And that's what we're going to focus on because the first person from a Jewish perspective that is really interesting is, of course, Abraham. And Abraham realizes that it is possible to have a unique relationship with the creator of the universe, both collectively and individually. It is possible to have that relationship. And that relationship has certain moral and ethical demands. That relationship is a relationship that we call covenantal. It is embodied in a concept that in, in, in Hebrew and in Jewish life is known as the concept of Brit. People sometimes think that the word Brit means circumcision. It doesn't. That's Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision. But the word Brit itself means covenant. There is a unique charge. There is a relationship coming from both sides, from the divine and from humanity, about how this project of revelation and redemption is going to work and unfold. I'm going to try now and move quickly because 
<laughs> <We're> all, <laughs> how am I going to do this, Ralph? We're already up to 23 minutes past. All right. And also, I don't want to be rushing at the end because we have a lot of material to cover. So buckle your seats because I'm going to go now. <sighs> I've just been winding up. All right. So then Abraham, and I'm going to do this part fairly quickly because it's all familiar to you. Ab one second. Let's get some. So that's the, let's call this 1800. Let's call this 1700. 1600. If I don't put the years in, we'll get confused. So really, let's talk about Isaac as the son of Abraham. And then Isaac has a son called Jacob. And that is the period uh, in Genesis where this covenantal relationship is formulated. These are the patriarchs of the Jewish people. This is all in the book of Genesis. This is a real focus of Genesis. The whole of the early stories of the Garden of Eden and the flood and so on. And I actually watched Noah on the plane um, when, when I was coming over here now to Germany. Has anyone seen that film? No one has seen that film. It's amazing. It shows how you live in a totally different part of the world, don't you? I mean, really. <laughs> this, is, this is the center of the world, not everywhere else. Um, can't believe they got Russell Crowe to play Noah. It was amazing. Uh, that, and and it's, also, it's also the period of the matriarch. So we've got Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And that is really, they are really the focus the building of this family relationship. If you look at chapter 17 of the book of Genesis, you will see that this whole program of revelation in a covenantal sense, a covenantal relationship between God and humanity is laid out, as well as the idea that within humanity, there is this specific covenant demands from the descendants of Abraham, those who participate in the Abrahamic covenant, both spiritual children, which we might call banim in Hebrew, and physical children, the concept of zarecha, the concept of your seed. And that's really the idea where there is a physical embodiment of this covenant in the actual flesh of your seed as you will go throughout history. The whole thing is laid out to Abraham. And then he says, uh, that's great, God, and, uh, but can you go back to the part where I have to circumcise myself, because that's not so simple. Uh, don't worry about that, Lid. And then Jacob has 12 sons and a daughter, and those sons of Israel, Jacob's alternate name is Israel. Jacob wrestles with an angel and takes on the name of Israel. And then the most famous of those sons, Joseph, by the end of the book of Genesis, brings the family down into Egypt. And so by the end of the book of Genesis, yes, we've only done one book, but it's an important book. By the end of Genesis, we, the, the family descended from Abraham, the, the, the family of Israel, Remember, Israel is just the alternate name of Jacob. The family of Israel is living in Egypt. Everything's cool. We're in a bit of a diaspora. It's a bit of an exile, but it's a very comfortable exile. Everything's fine. Then, in the book of Exodus, that comfortable existence outside of the land that was promised to Abraham, because it's probably pretty important that I mention that, there is a if Abraham is told about this covenantal relationship, it's going to become a little bit more important later on. It's not so fundamental now, but there is a place where this covenantal relationship comes to its full fruition. And that, of course, is the land of Canaan, the, which is going to ultimately become the land of Israel. And that, of course, is the land of Canaan. But at the time of Abraham, that's just settled by a whole range of different peoples. And Abraham is promised that land for his descendants, but that's going to happen in the fullness of time. First of all, we're going to go down into Egypt. Now, in Exodus in Egypt, we are enslaved. There's a new political regime, and the children of Israel, who by now, each of these sons has had obviously many descendants, and over the course of the next few hundred years, as a minority class within this wider Egyptian population, we are enslaved. That then really, really sets up the issue of it's now fully an exile. 1400, 1300, 1200, 1100. And so the Egyptian exile is, and the Egyptian slavery is probably somewhere like here. Now, don't, we, we, we sometimes 
become blasé. We sometimes become a little uh, immune to the incredible um, the contribution of the book of Exodus to our understanding of political theory and society. This is the point at which the idea that a nation can achieve liberation from oppression enters human culture. The idea that a nation is able to lift itself up out of oppression, a minority class, and be redeemed from slavery towards freedom and towards the achievement of autonomy in their goals. This is a massive idea, and this is exactly what the book of Exodus provides. So by the time we get to here, we also see that in the course of the first chapters of Exodus, in the midst of this slavery, is born a someone who is going to be instrumental in this redemptive project. It is, of course, the rise of Moses. We call Moshe. Here is the splitting of the Red Sea. I'm telling you this, you're all familiar with it. God is the redeemer, ultimately, but Moses is administratively in charge and takes the children of Israel. By now, not just the children of Israel, we're now a complete nation. We are an um is the Hebrew word for nation. We are Am Yisrael, or sometimes referred to as B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. And the children of Israel come out of Egypt, and let's not lose perspective. And I'm aware that we are going to have to move along. And they come out, and then... And the reason we have to spend time on this, because this is so foundational to the whole project of the Bible, is that this nation then stands before Mount Sinai, and here's the big light show, where the covenant, covenantal relationship with the patriarchs of the Jewish people is now reaffirmed with an entire nation on the other side of this slavery. We're now free, but we have no idea who we are. And then, boom, we stand before Sinai, and we are given the Torah. This program of social, ethical, moral uh, picture, really, of how this ideal society is going to be built. You're now a nation. You are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are now going to go into the land that was promised them, and you are going to build this ideal society. Here's how you do it. And as I've said on many occasions, and I'm going to say it again now, at Sinai, God said many things. Many things. But they can all be boiled down to two words in English. Be nice. Don't oppress one another. Look after the disadvantaged in society. Make sure everybody has equal facility before the law. Look after the widows and the orphans and the underprivileged. Don't let the gap between rich and poor. If you're going to build this society, says God, it must be founded on social justice. I can handle many things, says God. I've got a little problem with idol worship, but I can handle many things. But I will not tolerate social injustice. That is the key message emerging from Sinai. And that's why, and of course, the whole of the last chapters of the book of Exodus really deal with the construction of this sort of tabernacle type thing, um, uh, which we call the Mishkan. That's a very bad drawing, don't even look at it. The Mishkan, in which, uh, which was a, a structure designed to house the residents of the divine so that if we were behaving properly the divine would literally be resident among us the ultimate idea is that we create a world in which the in which god is able to reside in presence but for now we have this structure that was the sanctuary the tabernacle that really is the end of the book of exodus and then while we're still at sinai and whatever then we get the book of leviticus and leviticus is a book dealing mostly uh with the laws pertaining to priests and the whole cult of the tabernacle. It deals with dietary laws. It deals with laws of purity and impurity. It also, uh, interestingly enough, has some very, very acute statements dealing with human relations. And the great summary of the whole of the Torah is contained in the book of, e of Leviticus in three words. And you shall love your fellow human being as yourself. In other words, basically the golden rule, the underlying of wisdom throughout 
all spiritual systems and generations. But uh, due to our, uh, the Jewish people's, or the people, children of Israel's inability to really understand all that, uh, we wander in the desert for 40 years. That's where the book of Numbers, which is called Numbers in English, I don't know, what do they call it in German? They call it, um, sorry? Well, well, what would that be? Yeah, I don't know why it's called anything, but uh, you see, the, it, it, the, the, in Hebrew it's called Bamidbar, in the desert, and uh, because it takes place uh, in the desert. And it's called, but it's called Numbers because it's got a lot of numbers in it. And, it. and really the book of Numbers is a fascinating exploration of the concept of leadership and the concept of tribulation of an incredible generation that were going through just about everything that the Jewish people since then have gone through on a communal basis. And every challenge and every obstacle is really encountered, both spiritually and physically. It is a fascinating text, the book of Numbers. And then, just as he's about to die, as we are on the verge of the land of Israel and entering the land of Israel, Moses stands up and gives the book of Deuteronomy, which is really a whole long speech. Uh, going over the whole basic ideas of the Torah and it's, if you like, it's Moses' swan song before he climbs up the mountain and says goodbye to everyone because he is not going into the land of Israel. Thank you. You know what? I'm going to change from blue <laughs> and we'll go to black. So, that those five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, compose what is known as the Torah. The Hebrew Bible is known as Tanakh, which is an acronym standing for Torah, Nuviim, which means prophets, and Ketuvim, which are all sorts of writings that are difficult to place historically. So that is the T part. It is the T of Tanakh, the Torah are the first five books. That exists within the Jewish textual tradition on a different level to other texts. It's not the case that we treat the Bible homogeneously. Not even sure if that's a word. It is, there are levels, and the Torah exists on a level of sacredness above the other texts. Now, following which, we're on the verge of the land of Israel, the Torah is over, and now there's a new leadership. And it is the successor of Moses, Joshua. Joshua is a difficult book for our generation. There's no question about it. And I'm not going to try and hide behind the controversial aspects of Joshua. Joshua, what I will say, however, I mean, why, why, why am I saying Joshua is difficult and controversial? Because Joshua is charged with entering the land and basically wiping out a bunch of peoples and conquering towns. It's a conquest. It is a military conquest in, in the name of God, in the name of a, of a new type of, of, of living, a new type of spiritual system. But it is problematic for our generation to understand why God would be telling Joshua to wipe out various peoples. What I will say is this, and very few people have realized this observation, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but I really want to mention it, is that if we look at the conquests of Joshua, we find, amazingly, that the conquests of Joshua are exactly, almost exactly the opposite. If you look at a map of the state of Israel today in relation to the Palestinian territories of the West Bank, what Joshua conquered effectively is what is today the West Bank, and that which is we know and everyone's happy to call the land of Israel, regardless of your political situation, is Israel proper, was not conquered by Joshua, but was full of pagan tribes called Philistines and Canaanites and so on. It's a fascinating obverse, reverse of the situation today. Now, Joshua dies eventually, and then we enter in a new phase, which is the book of Judges. First of all, I'm going to give the whole historical overview, then we will look at each prophet individually. But the book of Judges is really the story of this couple of centuries of we've already basically conquered the land, but settling it is a whole other story. And so we are settling the land of Israel according to tribal allotments. Different tribes who are the descendants of, the, of Israel are taking 
different parts of the land allotted to them, and each one has their own challenges. There is no unified nation at this point. There's a confederacy of tribes, but there's no central administration. Ein Melech be Israel, says the book of Judges. There's no king in Israel. Everybody was doing what was correct in their own eyes. It was a type of spiritual anarchy. If there was a crisis, then someone would get up and deal with the crisis and then go back to the farm and retire. There was no dynastic succession. There was no centralized administration. During this period, our main... If I get texture on my face, please excuse me. But our main enemy in this period and during the whole of the next few generations is a local people whose cultural and spiritual center is in Gaza. They are the Philistines, the Plishtim, the term much, much later in Jewish history under the Roman Emperor Hadrian that who called the land of Judea Palestine after our traditional enemies from here, the Philistines. And we are also at a technological disadvantage at this point in the conquest of the land because what is happening here in world history, you all learned this at school, what's happening here if we were looking at the historical world background? This here is the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. The Hittites, uh, people who are right next to us, just to the north, have worked out how to crank up an oven to 800 degrees Celsius so they can smelt iron. And they have that technology. And if I have a bronze sword and you have an iron sword, you're going to make mincemeat of me. So over the next couple of centuries, without that technology, it's a hard slog, but eventually we occupy this territory. And... <laughs> You have to realize that each of the books I'm talking about could be an hour and a half length lecture in itself. So I'm having to move on and spend a minute. But we can't pass over this particular point here. <coughs> because by the end of the book of Judges, one of the tribes nearly gets genocided in a civil war, the tribe of Benjamin. There's very few left. And that is why it's phenomenal that when we go to the spiritual leader of the age... Here, at the beginning of the next book. The next book is the book of Samuel. And there's two books of Samuel. There's Samuel 1 and Samuel 2. You're a very intelligent audience. This is not America, so I don't have to explain to you that there actually aren't two Samuels. There's just one Samuel. Uh, but they divided the book editorially into two different sections. Samuel 1 deals with the rise and fall of the first king of Israel. Because we went to the prophet Samuel, the spiritual leader of the age, and we said, we want a king. And Samuel said, you, Am Yisrael, do not need a king. You are a unique nation on earth that has the opportunity to create a relationship directly with your father in heaven. You do not need anyone standing between you. Kings are not good. You don't want one. And they go, we understand, but can we have a king, please? Samuel says, look, a king is going to, <laughs> he's going to take your sons and put them in his army. He's going to take your daughters and marry them off to his mates. He's going to start wars you don't want. He's going to start buildings you don't need. He's going to tax you. And we go, yes, we know all that, but kings are cool. Can we have one? <laughs> and God says, if they want the king, I'll give them the king that they deserve. So we get a tall, hunky guy from the tribe of Benjamin called Saul. And basically the book of Samuel 1 is the rise and fall of the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel, who is Saul. And then Samuel 2 is the rise, the immense rise of this incredible figure who is called David, King David. King David has his own unique covenant with God. And King David goes, boom, 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 and he smashes all the air. He totally deals with the Philistines. If you read the end of Samuel 1, you think, well, the Philistines win the big war. It's all over. But along comes David and takes care of the whole Philistine problem and moves Israel to a new world stage, turns the land into a regional superpower, in the course of which he captures the Jebusite stronghold of Jerusalem and turns it into the eternal capital of the, of the people of Israel. That's in 1000 BCE. <coughs> so the book of Samuel deals really with the rise of the king. Saul, 
and David. And then I'm just going to draw here. So really, David is probably sitting round about minus 1,000. Now, all of this, this, all of this so far exists in what we call a theo-historical period. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. And in fact, more and more, we're pushing back the boundaries. Archaeologists and historians are finding more and more about this period. And so far, nothing's really inconsistent with the Bible. But we have to be very honest. We have to say there's no rock that says, Hi, I'm Deborah, one of the judges. I was here. We do have, we could call this period a proto-historical period. We are finding evidence that confirms some of the narratives in the Bible, but not yet specifically history. That's going to happen shortly. Now, I don't know if people want to face this way. I don't want you having to spend a fortune on chiropractic bills. Please feel welcome to turn this way if you want to. I'm going to, this is minus 1,000. This is minus, because uh, most of what I'm going to be doing now is on this wall. My, uh, minus 1,000, so let's call this, let's call this here, uh, let's call this minus 500. So I'm going to call this minus 900, minus 800, minus 700, minus 600. And we really have to get a move on. I'm going to be very quick now, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a historical overview before we deal with each of the books of the prophets to show exactly where they sit. Sometimes when we look at the Bible and we see a whole list of names, we go, oh, they're just books of the Bible, they're names, what are, you know, it's all merging into one. But in fact, every single prophet and every single book of the Bible has its own discrete project. But we need to see first the historical narrative. And the historical narrative from here, basically to the end of the Bible, is provided in the book of Kings. The book of Kings, Kings 1 and Kings 2, takes us from the end of the Davidic reign right until basically here, and here's how it works. First of all, David's son, King Solomon, builds in Jerusalem, now the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel, builds a temple, which is the house of God. That's an eternal structure dedicated to God in Jerusalem. It's amazing. Jacqueline, could you make sure you see me after this? Because you were mentioned in a phone call today, and I have to... Uh, and everything basically has gone according to plan because we've had the covenant with the Avot. Then we have the enslavement. Then we have the liberation. Then we get the Torah. Then we enter the land. Then we get the big king. And the big king's son builds the big temple. And everything has gone according to plan. But, <laughs> as always, there are problems. This, when King Solomon dies, this is a super important part to understand the whole mechanics of what happens next in the Bible is that after the death of King Solomon, the United Kingdom becomes split into two kingdoms. Ten of the tribes, ten of the twelve tribes form their own kingdom in the north. Is this microphone? The microphone is working, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, form their own kingdom in the north called the Kingdom of Israel. Started by Jeroboam the first and two of the tribes form the kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital and a Davidic king a descendant of King David on the throne in Jerusalem for the next two centuries these kingdoms are operating in parallel sometimes at war with each other sometimes at peace sometimes ignoring each other but we have two kingdoms here now, obviously, it is the southern kingdom that is the more stable because it has the Davidic succession. The succession in the northern kingdom, for the most part, was violent assassination. But what is really important here in this period is the constant erosion of social justice. The gap between rich and poor becomes too great. Leadership, it starts exploiting the people. Leadership becomes corrupt. Society gets corrupt values. Uh, and it's very, very not nice. The most famous prophet of this era, who is running around screaming the words of God and warning the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms, that, especially the north, that things are not good and will come to an end if they don't correct it, probably the most famous of all the prophets, doesn't have his own book. And that, of course, is Elijah. And Elijah the prophet, 
who really whose career really marks the end of Kings 1 and the beginning of Kings 2 with northern kingdom kings like Ahav, like Ahab and so on. He is arguing against not only social injustice but the importation of all sorts of idolatrous cults and when we see idolatry we see social injustice. Elijah is not this warm, fuzzy figure that people believe he is with inside Jewish history. They think that he's this really nice, wise old guy that meets you on street corners and tells you secrets and comes to your circumcision invisibly and to the uh, Passover Seder and sits and has wine. In the Bible, Elijah is this hairy, scary person and he runs around and he zaps people if they come too close and he's seriously scary. But eventually... Despite the warnings of the prophets, there is a new power in the region. Now we are fully into a historical framework. Now the accounts in the Bible are not just mentioned in the Bible, they're corroborated in the chronicles and historical documents of other nations, and we can see that physically in archaeological and historical evidence. But eventually the situation gets so bad that the new power, the Neo-Assyrians, this unstoppable empire coming out of Assyria, which is where Iraq, northern Iraq basically today sweeps across the Middle East and comes in and here's the, here's the split kingdom. They come and they ethnically cleanse the whole of the northern kingdom and they take the ten tribes away into the dustbin of history. We have not seen them since. That is the end of the kingdom of Israel. Now it's just the kingdom of Judah. That is why from here onwards we are the Jewish people. Jewish, Judaism, Judah. We are the remnant of the greater Israel. And the book of Kings explains that we have very, even in the southern kingdom, there were very few righteous kings. There's a righteous king here, King Hezekiah, who was probably the most righteous king after David. And there's another righteous king here, King Josiah, but apart from the, who is his great grandson. But apart from those, there's very, very few righteous kings. And eventually, the Assyrians are conquered, as we know, by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians come in minus 586, and they destroy the temple. Then we go into another exile. This is the Babylonian exile. The Babylonian exile, which lasted 70 years, as was famously prophesied on the eve of the destruction and then the Babylonians themselves, at the height of their power, are conquered by the Persians. And Cyrus, the great Persian leader, decrees that the Jewish people can go back to Zion, can go back to the land of Israel, a type of Balfour declaration on crack, and they can go back and he will sponsor the project and we come back here and we rebuild the temple. And that happens round about here. Now the book of Kings goes up to the middle of the Babylonian exile. That's the overview of historical narrative. Now, we have to start looking at some serious uh, time issues here. Oh, there you go. Right. Everybody follows so far. That's the historical narrative. The Bible more or less ends, not the book of Kings, but some of the later books that we're going to discuss, uh, really ends with the restoration of the temple and the restoration of a new Jewish society returning from the Babylonian exile to rebuild this temple. But uh, we're going to now talk about the famous prophets of the, of the Bible now that we've established the historical narrative. And what I'm going to show you now is something that I think is a very, very useful framework by which to understand all the prophets and very few people actually realize. First of all, we have three big daddy prophets. They're the three big ones. I know that there's a whole lot of other ones, but once we understand the three big ones, then every, all the others fall into place. The first of the three big ones, of course, is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is sitting here. Isaiah is a prophet that is sitting at the time of King Hezekiah. He's in the southern kingdom. He witnesses the vanquishment of the northern kingdom. And Isaiah is 
one of the most sublime contributions of Hebrew literature to world culture. Everybody should read the book of Isaiah at some point in their lifetime. It is phenomenal. And really, I'm going to spend a minute or two on, Isaiah, on the prophet Isaiah because the prophetic project has got many different aspects to it, but they're all really covered inside the book of Isaiah in various ways. And it's important to understand that when we get to around about the year 500, we see in the world a type of spiritual global renaissance happening around the world. Things are changing. If you look at the year 500 in all different parts, you'll see, for example, what's in minus 500 is the Buddha. Minus 500, the golden age of Greek philosophy. Zoroaster. All of these spiritual transformations are happening all around the world, except the Jewish people, where's their spiritual transformation in minus 500? And the truth is that we underwent our spiritual transformation prior to that, over the couple of centuries prior to that. And you really see that in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is saying several key things that are so fundamental that we need to understand them to understand what the prophets are on about in general. First of all, obviously, Isaiah is coming to rebuke the nation over social justice. In very, very harsh terms, the prophet tells the nations that they've complete the nation of Israel and Judah that they have completely lost their way. That they have totally lost sight of the value of social justice and the whole reason they are in that land for the first place. But Isaiah is doing much more than that. Isaiah and all of the prophets are giving the world, through the people of Israel, a unique concept <sighs> Before I tell you that unique concept, I want to I tell you something else that Isaiah is doing because it's also, so I, I, so I sometimes take this for granted, but maybe we just need to point it out. One of the transformative things that Isaiah is telling us about God is the shift from seeing God as just God of the people of Israel in the land of Israel. So, okay, you've got your God, Uga Buga, and we've got our God for the Bible, and everything's fine, and our God's more powerful than your God. Okay, we maybe believe that, but you know, Isaiah says, God is not just the God of Israel. God is God of the entire world and of the entire universe. God, the creator, the revealer, and the redeemer is, is God. And so the prophets, particularly Isaiah, are universalizing the concept of God. This is an important shift in our understanding of the divine. But in relation to God, we have a unique concept that the prophets are giving us. The concept of teshuvah. The concept of repentance. I mean, teshuvah really means teshuvah. It doesn't mean repentance, but repentance perhaps is a, is a closer translation as we'll get. The idea of response, the idea of return. The wisdom that is found in all spiritual systems, the true wisdom is that transform yourself and the world changes. It's hard but self-transformation is the key to becoming a better person. Remember that even in Leviticus, the Jewish people are not told to be religious. They are told to be holy. And holy is utterly dependent on our relations with other. Transform yourself. Become an honest, integral, just person and you will change the world. If we transform ourselves, then we can transform our entire society. If we transform our society, then we can transform the world. And if we transform the world, then we get a whole new concept in world spiritual culture that the prophets are talking about, which is this idea of the redemptive state of all of humanity. That is the messianic age. The idea of the Messiah, the idea of this ultimate point that humanity can arrive at if it affects that self-transformation to become just, honest and integral in their dealings with other. This is the key demand of God. The second big daddy prophet is sitting just on the eve of the Babylonian exile. That is Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah is you have to understand I give like lectures on Jeremiah that last for hours I got like two seconds on Jeremiah but Jeremiah is <coughs> a very difficult book to read Jeremiah is living in a generation that has effectively totally lost its way he's on the eve of the destruction of the temple he's on he's he's seeing a society that is utterly clueless about what it's meant to do but thinks it knows but think jeremiah read chapter 7 of jeremiah and why i'm saying chapter 7 is because i need people to understand in the world today the relevance of the prophetic message in the book of jeremiah Jeremiah goes down to the temple and the kings at the time are all persecuting him because he's, send, he's the only person who is giving this message that the presence of Israel and the land of Israel is not about territorial integrity. It is not about holding on to any specific place. It is about social justice. It is about revealing the oneness of God. It is about spiritual purpose it is about acting as a location whereby the divine can be led can be conduited if you like into the world so that we raise the whole of humanity to a higher level of divine consciousness jeremiah is a very very difficult book to read it was then and it is now and the prophet jeremiah doesn't even want to be a prophet he's He's actually tortured, and it's a very difficult book. But on the eve of the destruction, such is his incredible faith that he goes and buys a plot of land just near Jerusalem because he knows that the redemptive promise of God is that even though the people of Israel are about to undergo exile, they will return, they will rebuild, they will be reborn. And then the third big daddy prophet is sitting here in the just 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 around just after during and around the destruction and that is the book of Ezekiel and Ezekiel begins he's actually the first prophet to be speaking in the exile in the diaspora he's standing on the banks of the river Kabar and he sees this phenomenal revelation of God God is revealed to him in the exile Phenomenal except but the really important chapters in Ezekiel are chapters 8 to 10 when you realize that Ezekiel describes the withdrawal of the divine from Jerusalem. The withdrawal of the divine tragically from the people of Israel as the temple is about to be destroyed. These are cataclysmic moments in Jewish history and they're phenomenal within the context of the Bible. Not to mention chapter 37, chapter 38 of Ezekiel, the whole... <laughs> idea of the resurrection of the dry bones in the valley the idea that a nation through teshuvah through coming back to god through understanding what it is that god wants can transform themselves can transform the world even though they have been in the in the absolute pits of despair and sin ezekiel is ecstatic and then ezekiel gives us this vision of uh the phenomenal end of times all right. Now, in the context of that, then we have what we call the 12 minor prophets. There's nothing minor about them. They're just called minor prophets because they're much smaller books. The first of those is Hosea. Hosea is actually living here. He's in the northern kingdom, mostly, but he's prophesying here. And Hosea is a unique prophet. Anybody who's read the book of Hosea knows that it's a bizarre book and has a bizarre opening because God says to this very holy prophet I want you to go and I want you to find the most promiscuous woman that you can a woman who is an abs I don't even want to say the word in English because just in case it translates badly in German and you get offended but this a, a, a woman that's just beyond imagining in terms of her, her, her wantonness and I want you to marry her and obviously he does that and then they have children and then she leaves him and she comes back and she has affairs and she comes back and he keeps taking because he's in love with her and eventually the whole thing of course is a metaphor for the relationship between the people of Israel and God uh, then we have the book of Yoel the book of Yoel is one of those books that's very difficult to date uh, it's very difficult to say exactly when it was written but it sits between Hosea and Amos because it deals with the concept of Teshuvah 
קראו לבבכם ועל בגדיכם. When you fast, when you do repentance, it has to be an inner transformation. As I've often said, and I will say this, even if it does translate in German, it doesn't translate well in German, and I apologize already to the translators, but really, the key moment of all acts of Teshuvah is not about saying, oh, I'm going to become religious and I'm going to become holy. It's the question, why am I an asshole? That's where it starts. That question begins the understanding of what it is to be a person in the world in relation to other. Our relationship with the divine is utterly impossible unless we reconcile in justice and honesty and integrity our relationship with other. Yoel is sitting, so we, 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 we're going to put, I mean, most, most, most Bible critics would probably put Yoel uh, written somewhere here. Yoel deals also with all these waves of locusts that are symbolically representative of different types of invasions in the land of Israel. And then the, we have the book of Amos. The book of Amos is also sitting in the northern kingdom. Amos is a farmer. Phenomenal clarity. Read chapter 7, chapters 9 of the book of Amos. Amos is really the first to predict, amazingly, that the northern kingdom is going to be destroyed. By the way, obviously what I've left out in this entire narrative is the kings and the wars and everything. It's phenomenal. It's like, um, it's like Game of Thrones on crack. But it's it's a phenomenal one you get to hear. Then the book of Ovadia. We don't really know. I can't believe I said that. We, uh, the book of Ovadia, once again, we're not entirely certain. It's the shortest book. It's only one chapter. It talks about the destruction of Edom. And Edom is a neighboring tribe of Israel. That's why some people think it's written later, although the rabbis tell us that it was actually written earlier, more around the time of Elijah, because there's a figure called Ovadia that sits here. So in the absence of any other technical knowledge, we'll put it there, but it's a vision about the destruction of Edom. It's an important book for conspiracy theorists because Edom, of course, later in Jewish history, goes on to be representative of Rome and Rome then goes on to become representative of Christianity. And so it's a very, very interesting book for those who like that mystical ooga booga. Now, then, then we have a book that's familiar to you all, which is the book of Jonah, the book of Yonah. And Yonah is, is really sitting in the northern kingdom round about here, but Yonah is a prophet sent by God from Israel to prophesy repentance to another nation as part of the whole shift towards the universalization of the prophetic message. Yonah has four chapters, one's in a boat, one's in a fish, one's in a city, and finally the aftermath of that. Jonah is really the hamlet of the Bible. It's like, oh, I don't want to, well, I'm going to be, I don't want to prophet, oh, he runs away, he can't handle it, whatever. But Jonah, of course, is a symbol, tell us the mystics, of the Jewish people themselves. They're descent into the whale as the descent into exile in order to effect this change in humanity, this change in the world. Then there's the prophet Micha. The prophet Micha is a younger contemporary of Isaiah. He's like everything Micha is talking about, everything Isaiah is talking about in 66 chapters, the, the prophet Micha does in seven chapters. It's like Isaiah on turbo. And of course, the ultimate, some of the ultimate incredible summaries of the whole prophetic message contained in the book of Micha. If you look, for example, in chapter 6, Ma higidlecha Adam. He's already told you, man, Ma Hashem elokecha doresh mehimach. What is God actually asking from you? Asot mishpat. Do justice. Ahavat chesed. Love kindness. V'hatsnea lechet im Hashem elokecha. And just walk humbly with your God. Already Hosea has told us, I don't want your sacrifices, says God. I'm not interested in formal religion. I've had enough. You think I need them? I'm interested in your ethical response to my call. How are you going to improve yourself as an individual, as a nation, as a world? So that I can once again reside within it. Now, in this period here, in this period here, after the vanquishment of the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom had a very, very bad series of awful kings who basically wiped out any descent. People like Menashe, king of Judah, 
So we only have one prophet from this entire period, and that's the prophet Nahum. Nahum is three chapters. The first chapter is about the destruction, the impending, he prophesies on the destruction of Assyria. The second chapter is about the destruction of Assyria, and the third chapter is about the destruction of Assyria. It is three chapters on very, very detailed on exactly what's going to happen in the downfall of Assyria, and of course it happens pretty much as he says. Then we have two younger contemporaries. So these, these are clustered around Isaiah. He's the big daddy, but these are the ones that are clustered around it. Then the cluster here of Jeremiah is the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a phenomenal uh, exploration of the idea of tyranny. That tyranny sows the seeds of its own destruction. It's really a theological question, Habakkuk. How is... Listen, God, I don't understand. The Babylonians are going to come. They're going to destroy everything. But the righteous are going to be swallowed up with the wicked. How do we survive this? Tzadik be'emunato yichyeh, says Chabakuk. But the righteous will live through his sincerity, through his honesty. The world will shift. The righteous will survive. There is always hope. But just as the beams and walls and stones of a very house cry out if it's built in social injustice, so is a tyrannical society sowing the seeds of its own destruction. It's a very, very powerful book. And the book of Tsefania, his contemporary, also on the eve of destruction. And Tsefania is talking, very short book, also three chapters, talking about how the fact that the exile that's going to happen has a purpose. It has a historical and cosmic purpose for which the Jewish people are going to go through this repeated pattern. Then what happens is the temple is rebuilt under the decree of Cyrus, which is actually mentioned. Isaiah itself, as you would know, is divided into two parts. Uh, chapters 1 to 39 are very much set in this historical context, but chapters 40 to 66 are really talking about here. And we come back and we rebuild the temple and then we get three very important prophets. Haggai, who is talking about the importance of seeing the temple in balance. Just as Jeremiah was concerned about the over-focus on the temple and saying that it's not about having the temple, it's really about something else. So Haggai is saying, yes, but it's important still to have a spiritual location, to be centered spiritually at the same time that you build your society and your economy. And we get Zechariah. Zechariah is an ecstatic vision of what the world will look like and what the role of the Jewish people will look like if humanity can ultimately achieve this idea that the divine has shown through the prophets about the, what the world can look like and then we get the last of the prophets who is the prophet Malachi and the prophet Malachi is coming along at the this early stages of the second temple period where we're now entering into a new historical phase and Malachi is recalling to us the Torah of Moses and saying if you're gonna do this do it properly but I, at the end of days, says Malachi, Hinea nochi sholeach lachem, Behold, I'm going to send you Eliyahu Hanavi. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. That is why in Jewish tradition, Elijah the prophet is seen as the herald of the Messianic age. Because as Malachi tells us, Elijah is going to come back and he's going to reinstitute the prophecy, the tradition of prophecy, which was lost after Malachi. Everything in Jewish, the continuum of Jewish spirituality and revelation went down to the level of, of uh, spiritual intuition, what we call Ruach HaKodesh, the, the spirit of holiness. But pure revealed prophecy ends with Malachi. What is Elijah going to do when he comes back, says Malachi? Ve'hishiv le'vavot al banim ve'lev banim al ha'avot. I'm going to reconcile the hearts of the children with the parents and the parents with the children. Intergenerational reconciliation in order to understand that there is an ongoing continuum, a repeated message. Your ancestors didn't listen, but God keeps holding out hope that humanity will realize its potential, that we will turn around and say, ah, oh, economic growth and material values are not the center of our existence, but rather the, what should be the central value of all human aspiration is kvod ha'adam, the dignity of the human being. Humanity has never actually made that its central project. That's the end of the n part. Right, I realize now that I've got one minute to do the rest of it. You will forgive me, uh, but I'm going to do the k 
the Ketuvim very quickly. It's a shame because there's so much going on. We have these are part, these are the writings of the Bible that haven't yet fit into any historical schema. So what we have here is the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a phenomenal expression of all different emotional uh, and spiritual states. Anyone who has sat down at a time of, of, of great need and opened the book of Psalms and read it finds that it, it, it really does uh, speak to the heart and from the heart. It's uh, a document that obviously was, contains reflections of compositions at different times, but it is attributed in the Jewish tradition, the book of Psalms is attributed to King David. And there's 150 Psalms, and there's really one for every occasion. But the, if, you, if, you, if you merit to read the book of Psalms in Hebrew, then you will realize just how sublime it is. <sighs> then, this is in the order as it appears in the Jewish Bible, uh, we have the book of Mishle, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a book of unique, u unique spiritual value, extolling in many ways the importance of this concept that the book of Proverbs is going on about, this concept of Chochmah, this concept of wisdom, an exploration of what is wisdom and why, why are human beings ignoring wisdom? Why do, we, why, why do we all think we know what wisdom is, but in fact none of us really pursue wisdom as a central value and objective? And then we have a book that's just... And that is a book that, till today, no one knows exactly when it was written. No one even really knows what it's about. It's got the most difficult Hebrew of the whole Bible. It's one of our great contributions to world spiritual culture again. And it is, of course, the book of Eov, the book of Job, which is a deep, deep exploration of the concept of suffering. Not of evil, but of suffering. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's a very, very deep book that looks at all the different answers. And uh, no one really has come. We certainly don't know when it was written. Um, it was possibly written around here. There's a very famous rabbinic tradition that Eov was a contemporary of Moses. Uh, it seems strange to put Eov here, but I'm going to put, uh, well, uh, I, 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 and within that tradition, by the way, just I know I don't have time, but this is so important. Why do the rabbis put Eov, the book of Job? Why do they put, how do you say that in German? Eov. Why do the rabbis put it here? Because we have a famous Midrash that tells us that when Pharaoh wanted to destroy the Jewish people, the people of Israel, he took advice from three counselors, one of whom was Bilam, who went on and he said, Bilam, the figure from the book of Numbers who tried to curse the people of Israel, said, oh, kill the Jewish people. That's an excellent idea. I think that's a very, you know, you should do that. And Jethro, and Jethro was so appalled by this idea that he ran away to the desert and became the father-in-law of Moses. And Eob, who was neutral. And that, say the rabbis, is one of the reasons why Eob underwent such a tremendous cataclysmic series of awful events that happened to him because to be neutral in a time of moral crisis is probably the worst position that you can hold. But I'm going to put Eob here in deference. No, you know, you know let's put Eob here. Uh, I mean, I'm putting Eov here because we can put him anywhere. Uh, but pos probably written more around there. It's different compositions. Then we have the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is so mystical and complicated and difficult to understand that even Daniel tells you himself, I don't understand this book that I've written. Daniel is sitting here. Uh, Daniel, of course, is once again a favorite of people that are trying to work out the end of times. The missing because he gives some tremendous prophecies that have been at the foundation of a lot of speculative attempts to work out when the Messiah is coming. So far, everyone's got it wrong because apparently uh, we're still waiting. And then uh, we have what we call the Megillot. So we have a series of books. Uh, that are well, with two other books attributed attributed traditionally to King Solomon. One, of course, is the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs, which we're told was written by King Solomon in his youth, it shows that the Bible is not scared, the Bible is not afraid of expressing ideas in erotic imagery. It is a tremendously erotic allegory of something going on. Now, some people think it's not an allegory. It's just purely an erotic love song. 
But of course, over the last thousands of years, people have developed the Book of Song of Songs to be talking about a great many things. But it is probably, next to Isaiah, the most sublime poetic expression uh, that the Bible has. It's a phenomenal book, and it's amazing to read in any language, but to read in Hebrew is something else. And also Solomon is attributed with the Book of Kohelet. The Book of Kohelet is a philosophical work that expresses a type of cynicism. The rabbis, much later on in the Talmudic period, wanted to ban the Book of Kohelet because they thought people would just read it and get depressed and get turned off the whole spiritual concept. But in fact, it's the ending of the Book of Kohelet. Sof davar kol nishma, the end of the day when everything's been heard and said. Et Elohim yura, just fear God with mitzvotav shmor and keep his commandments. Kizek kol ha'adam. That is the whole point of a human being, is to really be a vehicle for the expression of the divine in the world. That we have the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is set uh, back here in the time of the judges. In fact, it starts, Vayihibimesh vodashoftim, at the time of the judges. Ruth is very interesting because a Moabite es, a woman coming from a completely different nation, joins the people of Israel and is accepted, and not only accepted, but becomes, through her faith and integrity, becomes the great grandmother of King David himself. Then, uh, towards the end of the Bible, we find that we have two books, oh, 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 we have the book of Echa, the book of Lamentations, which is attributed to Jeremiah. It's the, it's the book that is a poetic, agonizing, tragic description of the mourning. It is a book of mourning about the destruction of the temple. Echa Yashvabadad, how she sits alone, Ha'ir Abatiyam, the city that was so amazing. Jeremiah witnesses the destruction and sits down and utters this incredibly mournful expression. Interestingly enough, when you look in Hebrew, the word Echa, the word Echa, Put your hand up if you're familiar with Hebrew. Okay? So the word Echa, which is a poetic form of saying how. Echa ra yashvabadad, how she sits alone. That word is exactly the same word that we find back here in the relation to Adam. Remember when Adam and Eve sin and they're hiding and God comes along in the garden and he says Ayeka. Different word, but spelt exactly the same. Ayeka, where are you? And so people say, well, why does God need to ask Adam where he is? Like, God doesn't know Adam's hiding in the bush. And Ayeka is a question for every generation, every human being, every society. Ayeka, where are you? Where are you in relation to your fundamental purpose and continuum? At the end of the second, at the beginning of the second temple period, we have Ezra and Nehemiah, two separate books. Ezra and Nehemiah come and they reconstitute the society. Ezra reestablishes the book of Deuteronomy really effectively as the constitution of the Jewish people. The book of Deuteronomy has its own interesting history that was rediscovered during the Josianic revolution that happened just prior to Jeremiah. And Nehemiah builds the walls of Jerusalem and reestablishes the temple orders and so on. And then right at the end of the Bible, you have two books called Chronicles... One and two. And that is a whole summary of the whole of the Bible that you could probably read in an hour. So if you didn't want to listen to someone like me explain it like that, you could just read the book of Chronicles and it will give you basically the whole picture from where to go. The book of Chronicles goes up basically to David and Chronicles 2 goes to the end. I have unfortunately gone over time, but I didn't want to compromise on covering everything in the Bible. I don't think I've left anything out, but I, you've been a very good audience and thank you for your attention. Obviously, as always happens, I will go through pain when I remember the things that I didn't say and the things I wanted to communicate about the Bible. The Bible is an extraordinary, extraordinary document that sits at the heart of the, as, as Ralph was saying, it really sits at the heart of the whole of the spiritual projection of the Jewish people into the world. The Jewish people exist with a purpose in the world. That purpose is not just to survive and, 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 uh, uh, and do whatever they do. It is really embedded in the way that, uh, in, the, in the idea of the spiritual progression of humanity. So long as we do not understand the Bible, the world 
remains in a, in, in a state of non-redemption. When we, when we look around at the world today and we see so much suffering and we see so, much, so many challenges to try and bring about what should be quite a simple exercise of arriving at the dignity of human beings and peace and move beyond the current stage, then the Bible still has a lot to tell us. We are encouraged to read the Bible, in a sense, critically, to ask questions of it. To not just accept it on face value, but to say, what do these words mean? What do these messages mean? How are these messages relevant to us today? And that is really the ongoing tradition of the Jewish people. Rashi, the great medieval commentator of the Bible, the greatest commentator of the Bible of the Jewish people, asks the question on the very first verse of Genesis. Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki of Troyes in the 11th century asks the question, why does the Torah begin with the creation. If the Torah is really just a book about laws, it should begin with Exodus, because it's in Exodus that we start to get the first laws that we have to, the first commandments. It's a book of commandments, that's why I want to show me, show me what I have to do. Don't tell me, I don't want to know how the world was made. Tell me what I have to do. And the answer, says Rashi, is because... God says, there will come a time, there will come a time, and this Rashi is saying this in the 11th century based on a much older Midrash on the first chapter, there will come a time when the nations of the world will say to the people of Israel, you stole the land of Israel, you took it, you occupied it, you stole it. And the Torah begins with the creation of the world to show the world, to show the Jewish people, and to show the world that the universe was created by God. And God takes the land of Israel and he gives it to who he wants. If the Jewish people merit it through the fulfillment of their purpose, then they are to settle the land of Israel. When the Jewish people do not fulfill the purpose, they are removed from the land of Israel. And as Jeremiah says, don't think that can't happen. We must, as a nation and as a world, return to the sense of purpose. It's not a question now. It's not a question now of whether the Jewish people should be in the land of Israel. We have seen over the last couple of millennia what happens when the Jewish people did not have their own homeland. We need it. But don't think, and I talked last night about the elephant in Zimmer, that we can't ignore this issue that we are living at very troubled times for the Jewish people. And it is my fervent prayer and hope that through returning to our roots, through returning to the sources of all the religions that emerge from the Abrahamic covenant, what does Abraham say? What does Abraham say to his nephew who is vying for the land? If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. These conflicts can only be solved theologically when we accept the existence and presence of the other as a fact in the world. Then, on a theological level, and Islam and Christianity and Judaism must go through that inner transformation that these things will never be solved through violence, but only through a re-understanding re of what it is that God wants from people. And all of that is contained in the Bible. So thank you for listening to that. I know that... Uh, I know that we have gone over time, but I'm, uh, so with Sophie's uh, permission, I'm happy to take one or two questions, but we'll, people uh, have obviously been sitting for a while and want to run away, but I'm happy to take one or two questions if anyone needs that. Thank you, guys. No? Everything's clear? Fantastic. Yeah, we have a side to By the way, by the way, I want to share something with you. I want to share something that I wasn't going to share. It's uh, a bit personal, but I thought you might find it interesting. I do. 
about a year ago, I was asked um, by a well-known, I'm not going to say the name, but a well-known production company in Hollywood who got very excited by the fact that Hollywood was now getting very interested in the Bible. And they created Noah, and so all these Hollywood producers standing, oh, the Bible, the Bible. So I was contacted through a series of third parties, and I was contacted uh, and asked, do you know any good stories from the Bible <laughs> that, that, that would make a good movie or, or a television series? Because obviously we're going through the golden age of television at the moment. So what we can do now in television, whether it's, you know, uh, and all the, I don't need to tell you all the different television series that are coming out in the English-speaking world, certainly, and really quite incredible. And could we do something like that with the Bible? And I said, if you're going to do anything, this is what you want to do. What you want to do is you want to create using something like, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings style epic or Game of Thrones, the way that they manage their detail. If you want a book that's got everything in it, that would make a phenomenal television series. If you want something that's got violence and sex and more violence and more sex and wars and phenomenal stories and upheavals and transformations and everything, then there's one thing you've got to do and that would be to create a multi-series television epic absolutely faithful to what the Bible tells you of the book of Samuel, the rise of the king. Because what is the book of Samuel about, ultimately? The book of Samuel is about two peoples that are fighting a struggle for historical survival in the one land. One people occupy the center of the country, one people occupy the coast. And then what the people on the coast realize, the, what the Philistines realize, is that so long as Israel is not united behind a king, listen carefully, so long as Israel is not united behind a king, they can never be defeated. Get them to unite behind a king, and the king becomes the symbol of the nation. Defeat the king, you defeat the nation. And that is exactly what happens in the book of Samuel. If you look at the, you read the, the end of the book of Samuel 1, Saul and his sons die in the famous battle against the Philistines. There's huge, there's five different war battles in the book of Samuel 1, but the big one, at Mahar Gilboa, and Saul is killed, and therefore it looks like the people of Israel are vanquished from history and the Philistines have won. But what was unique about David? What was unique about, why was a special covenant? Why is the Messiah called the son of David? What was unique about David is he came from very humble origins. He was a shepherd. He was not effectively actually a man of war. He was a man of peace. And if we are to produce the sort of person that is going to reflect the values that the Bible is telling us, about how we can solve the world's problems, then we must get back to understanding that challenges, challenges of humanity are never solved by violence, even though I thought it was the series they should make because it's got a lot of amazing violence in it, and people love violence. But I just wanted to share that with you because the Bible is becoming more and more relevant now as a, as a document that people are looking to, to return to their sources, not just theologically, but also commercially as well. So I think we'll see more of that. I have no idea whether they're going to make that series or not, but they certainly got very excited by the idea. I'm only saying that. I'm going to let you go. There don't seem to be any questions. Sophie, did you want to wrap up? That's fantastic. I've, I've either completely succeeded or completely failed. It's so, so fast. one of the two. Yeah. There's one question. I want to bring in a micro. Oops, sir. Einen Moment, ich gebe Ihnen ein Mikro, dann können wir Sie alle hören. Dass die Urgroßmutter von David eine Rolle gespielt hat. The grandmother of David. Mm, yeah, the great grandmother of David was Ruth. And Ruth is here. Uh, and, 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 and <laughs> this, I th uh, this is obviously the Bible's way of telling us that, that whilst the, 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 the Jewish people, while the people of Israel are a unique and discreet 
entity within history, they're not a closed shop. It is open to all peoples in the world. The origins, it's interesting you say that about, about Ruth, because, in other words, David, King David's great-grandmother was herself a convert, and one of the interesting points about that was that the Torah had said that Moabites should not come into the people of Israel, but she was not a Moabite, she was a Moabitess. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting whole discussion there. And, of course, uh, it, it shows that um, the uh, Jewish people actually exist. Um, uh, that, uh, as, as, as at the nexus of humanity, really, um, in, in order to uh, achieve what it needs to achieve. It's a very, very fascinating story, Ruth. It's actually a, uh, it's beautifully, beautifully written, and, uh, but it definitely has a message for us about, about acceptance, about acceptance, and about loyalty, and about sincerity. And that's why she merited to be, and humility, and that's why she merited to be the, uh, the great-grandmother of David. But yeah. She definitely plays a role. And that's why the book of Ruth is read, still, in the synagogue every year. Uh, when is it read? Exactamundo. It's read on the festival of Shavuot, which uh, is the festival of the giving of the Torah. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah. No, no. Um, David. David, we have one more question here. Yeah, with yeah, the mic. No, no, no. We don't have a question, because this woman's question is outstanding. Okay, hold on. And let me give it her a mic. It wasn't a question. It was a book that I left out. So, first of all, above anything else, thank you. Because I actually, you know, I finish up this big, you applause, you clap, and then she's sitting there going, oh, he's left out a book. And of course I had. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, because I was going in my mind through the Megillot, so we were doing, we were doing uh, um, A Song of Songs and Kohelet and Eicha and Ruth, and of course the fifth of those is the book of Esther. And it's interesting that you say that. The historical background of the book of Esther is here, in, under the Persians, uh, who have just conquered the Babylonians, and it's round about the time of the decree of Cyrus, and the book of Esther is here. Now, I want to just talk about the book of Esther for two seconds, uh, since thank you so much for mentioning it, because obviously how I would feel if I went away from here, going, ah, oh, I promised you 39 books. Um, the book of Esther, uh, uh, we have no, despite what they might, some people might think, we actually do not really have uh, any historical basis or evidence of the narrative contained in the book of Esther. It's a very, very unique book, the book of Esther. It describes the miraculous salvation of the whole of the Jewish population under the Persian Empire under the threat of a potential genocide. And yet the name of God is not mentioned at all in the book of Esther, despite this miraculous salvation. And it's very clear that the book of Esther is trying to talk about the idea of salvation that comes through natural means. Not a revealed miracle, as we might have seen, you know, here in the splitting of the Red Sea, but through the processes of history, God is embedded, in a sense, behind the scenes. The word Esther itself means hidden. Now, anyone who has read the book of Esther, certainly anyone inside the Jewish world who reads the book of Esther, doesn't have to worry about historical circumstances because they know, and our generation knows only too well, that the book is at a metaphysical level contains a tremendous truth about how um, about how uh, from time to time entire nations can undergo a form of uh, psychosis and a form of leadership that seeks to to genocide. And many, many people have drawn parallels, mystical parallels between what happens, the events accounted in the book of Esther, and what happens much, much, much later um, in, in a place not too far from where we are right now. So, uh, 
it, 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 it has a, and, and yet we can't find it historically. It talks about kings and we don't know who they are. We know when it's set, but we don't really can't locate it. So the idea of Esther, the idea that God is hidden in history is the very essence of the book of Esther. And I'm very pleased, and of course, not to mention the fact that um, in the Bible we talk about a lot of men, and we should realize that really at every juncture in the Bible there are women. There are women who are leaders, women who are warriors, women who are prophets, women who are sages, and women who are redeemers. And Esther is an example of that. Redemption in Jewish life is always sparked by the rise of the feminine. And that then brings about the redemptive uh, receptivity to the influx of the divine in the world. But because effectively humanity is essentially female. We have one last question here, and then we're going to finish. Yeah, then we're going to wrap. One um, Sorry. Well, thank you, of course, for a very... I'm here. Hello. Yeah. Uh, of course, this was not uh, an innocent historical overview. You also have a very uh, subtle and very nice message for peace. Um, at least, I, I understood it like that. So my question for you is, uh, 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 what would be... Uh, what, are, what were the reactions... Uh, for example, have you tried uh, to make this presentation, say, in Tel Aviv or somewhere in Palestine? Uh, could, there, could, could it itself be a tool to make better understanding uh, in, in the Middle East? Uh, have you tried to use it in this way before? I have given this lecture in Hebrew, and I've given it in Israel. Um, I've given it, I mean, you said Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv's easy. Um, I've given it in Tel Aviv, but I've also given it in Yerushalayim. And uh, I know you said that it has an agenda, that it's not entirely innocent. But, and I know you meant that in a nice way, but I, I, I just want to address that because at the end of the day, um, even when I've given it to people uh, who are uh, several degrees to the right of Attila the Hun, they, even they... Uh, cannot really refute um, anything I'm saying because I'm just giving over what the Tanakh is saying, what the Bible is saying. Anyone, any, any, anyone who tells you that the ultimate aim of humanity is for one group of people to impose their version of truth on the rest of humanity in whatever means is possible, has not understood the Bible, and I'll stand by that statement. Uh, but I do, I know not only what you've just said, I know the subtext of what you've just said, and I agree with you. It's not about me, it's not about my reading, it's about going back to the sources themselves. People who are running around saying a lot of things in the name of God are not actually reading the source texts. Uh, we have a lot of questions on the Bible, we have a lot of challenges, but we know that God wants humanity to be just. And we know we God wants humanity to be considerate and caring of each other. God says again and again in the Bible, I'm much more concerned with how you treat each other than your relationship, uh, the way you approach me. And I, I, I do believe, I do believe it is a vehicle by which we can, uh, which we can move. Because ultimately, and I haven't come to Germany for this week uh, to be a crusader, but um, something needs to change. We, we, we can't leave the next generation with this problem. We can't keep this cycle going. We can't. And, 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 and I'm not just talking about the 20th century cycle. This cycle's been going on for a thousand years, but the, the, at least. But the cycle that we're seeing just in the last few decades, we can't, we can't do that to our children. We can't do that to our grandchildren. We must leave them a better world. And it is no coincidence to me that the key to understanding world conflict really resides in the Middle East, and it really resides in one place. And we have to work out. Everybody knows, everybody knows the final story. It's just how much blood are we going to shed till we get there. And until we all, every side in that huge discussion of conflict, starts assessing not what the other should be doing, but what they themselves should be doing. The Prophet Yeshayahu is constantly talking about the idea of self-transformation. It is our issue. We need to own this, and we need to solve it. 
and we need to solve it now. And that is why the Torah is important. And uh, David, thank you so much. David Solomon, um, vielen, green vielen hands. Yeah, green hands. <laughs> So you are an alien, actually. I am. I yes, you are. My true um, colors are revealed. Tausend Dank, dass Sie hergekommen sind. Um, für die, die es nicht wissen, David Solomon lebt in Australien und ist uh, 36 Stunden lang hierher geflogen mit ein paar Stops und muss jetzt auch uh, morgen wieder zurückfliegen, 36 Stunden, um zu uns zu sprechen. Er hat in Amerika den Status eines Rockstars. Ähm, auch wenn er gerade, wenn er denen immer erklären muss, dass Samuel 1 und 2 nicht zwei Leute sind. Und wir freuen uns, wie gesagt, wirklich sehr, dass wir ihn nun zum zweiten Mal gewinnen konnten, hierher zu kommen. Äh, für die, die sich fragen, was ist das eigentlich für ein Typ? Ist das ein Künstler oder ist das ein Intellektueller? Er, er ist mehreres. Er hat ähm, eine künstlerische Karriere schon hinter sich, auch eine akademische. Ähm, er hat diverse studiert, unter anderem Anthro Anthropologie, äh, jüdische Abschlüsse in jüdischen Studien, äh, fünf Jahre in einer Yeshivot äh, studiert, das sind so äh, jüdische Talmudschulen, er hat äh, englische Literatur studiert, er hat ähm, äh, Film studiert, er hat selber mehrere Filme gemacht, er hat als Radiomoderator gearbeitet ähm, und äh, heute ist er eigentlich in erster Linie ein Gelehrter, ähm, er reist durch die Welt und äh, lehrt, gibt sein Wissen weiter, auf diese faszinierende Art und Weise, dass er es schafft, sich selbst unter Zeitdruck zu setzen und eben so komplexe, riesige Themen innerhalb einer Stunde ähm, in unterschiedlichsten äh, äh, Zuschauern oder äh, Audienzen gegenüber äh, zu vermitteln, auf eine Weise, dass wir es verstehen. Es scheint uns irgendwie einfach oder zugänglich und dabei ist es zum Teil extrem komplex. Und ähm, ich kann... Äh, das, was er am Ende gesagt hat, äh, ist einer der wesentlichen Gründe, warum wir diese Veranstaltung hier machen. Judentum bedeutet Lernen, die sich nun zum vierten Mal äh, jährt innerhalb der jüdischen Kulturtage. Es ist extrem wichtig, dass die Menschen sich die ähm, ursprünglichen Quellen selber durchlesen, dass sie nicht die Interpretation Dritter übernehmen, dass man sich nicht so leicht blenden lässt. Es ist so wahnsinnig einfach heutzutage, sich blenden zu lassen durch Schlagzeilen, durch das, was andere Leute einfach in die Welt setzen. Und das führt zu, äh, zu, zu, unter, und, zu Katastrophen. Und äh, deswegen ist es wichtig, dass man sich ähm, den, die Ursprünge immer durchliest, egal in welchen Religionen, aber die jüdische gilt auch dazu, zählt auch dazu, und äh, ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Geduld und für Ihre äh, Wissensbegierde und äh, dass Sie hergekommen sind heute an dem schönen Abend und sich das hier angehört haben. Und bis ganz bald. Oh. Thank you, ich möchte der heinrich böll stiftung ganz herzlich danken, ähm, die uns das hier ermöglicht hat in diesen wunderbaren Räumen. Ich möchte unseren beiden äh, Übersetzern ganz herzlich danken, Gabriela Leovic und Stephen Tree, die diesen, dieses rasante Tempo aufhalten können. Und äh, wünsche Ihnen eine schöne Heimfahrt. Thank you very much.